The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents Man at the Gate. Here you will learn how to apply your Christian ethics in the political arena. This includes our local and federal politics. Come, sit, relax, and enjoy our time together as we discuss the state of our nation and what it looks like to be salt and light in a pagan world. Hi, welcome to another episode of Man at the Gate. I am your host, Kerry Appling. I just want to thank everyone for a successful first episode from last week about civil asset forfeiture and the word of faith humanism. I got a lot of really good feedback um, and some good pointers uh, from brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you so much. It's very difficult to come up with um, heavy concepts on uh, what we're talking about. I'm trying to get better uh, from podcast to podcast, so stay patient with me. If you have any further um, pointers or anything you'd like to uh, point out to me, please private message me or even uh, post on my Facebook and uh, let me know. Today we are going to talk about the messianic character of education. Now, Rush Dooney, R.J. Rush Dooney has a book Along those same lines, um, I have never read it, surprisingly. I can recommend the book to you, um, only because I know about the character of the man who wrote it. And I have also read extensively from Rush Dooney on education, and so I know whatever he has to say in that book is probably world-breaking and sort of uh, the, the renewing of the mind you need as it comes to education. First and foremost, the first thing I want to do is if you do not have children or you are a grandparent and you no longer are educating children or uh, you have no children in your life or you're not even uh, planning on having children, please, I beg you, listen to this podcast because we have all been affected by the education that we grew up with. Most of my listeners probably grew up in the public school system. Many of you didn't. So uh, this will be an interesting podcast for you either way, because the way we were raised, the way we were educated as children, um, whether it was good or or evil, informs us about how we should educate others, and we may be entirely blind to it. So I want to encourage you not to say, hey, this is for families, or this is for school teachers, or this is for another crowd. This is for you, brother and sister, who is listening. No, it's not for anyone else. You would be surprised at maybe some of the blind spots you have about maybe even uh, the way you think about children or the way you think about learning or higher education, things like that. <clears throat> so keep that in mind. So I want to start off first and foremost with Scripture. We are going to be going to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses not 4 through 9, and then we're going to go to Psalm 1. 1 through 2, and then we're going to springboard from there. So here is Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear the word of the Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down. And when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Psalm 1, 1 through 2 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates both day and night. Amen. So as we push forward, I first and foremost want you to know that this is not an apologetic podcast episode for why you should homeschool. Once again, I think much has been written about that. If you are curious as to if you should or shouldn't homeschool, please private message me. I encourage everyone to homeschool 
or at least private school. Uh, if you need my position, homeschooling is the only biblical way to educate your children, in my personal opinion, from what I have read from Scripture. I don't go by experience. I don't go by anything other than what the Word of God commands as it pertains to the education of children. I also want to um, ask everyone who's listening to my podcast to read position papers by R.J. Rushdoony. Currently, Chalcedon has the uh, Chalcedon uh, ministry has printed a series of his position papers called An Informed Faith, and they've basically taken every position paper Rushdoony has ever written. I am slowly going through these, and they blow my mind. They are devotional in sort of their length. Each paper is maybe a page or two long. Three, five would be the longest. There's something you can get up in the morning while you're reading the Word of God, read through a position paper, get really challenged. But Rush Dooney has helped me to work through uh, education, as have some other people. But here's what Rush Dooney, I want to start with a quote from Rush, or not a quote, but some reading from Rush Dooney. Here's what Rush Dooney says in his position paper called Aristotle versus Christ. The origin of the concept of state control of education have pagan roots, and they are best set forth by Aristotle and his politics. For Aristotle, the state, quote, is the highest good of all and embraces all the rest. He, he sees man as simply, quote, the best of animals and, quote, a political animal. Moreover, the citizen should be molded to suit the form of government under which he lives. Furthermore, neither must we suppose that any one of the citizens belongs to himself, for they all belong to the state, and are each of them a part of the state. So here's what Rush Dooney says, Education for Aristotle must be regulated by the state, and for him this was beyond question. This should be no surprise to us. All non-biblical cultures of antiquity were radically totalitarian. So I want to jump down here. I also want to read this. It says, um, For the Christian, salvation is only possible by Christ's atonement. For Aristotle, salvation is statist to the core and is by means of education. For the Christian, education cannot be salvic or messianic because only Christ can regenerate and save man. In the tradition of Aristotle, the state by education can remake man. These two views are mutually exclusive, and it is only man's propensity to avoid conflict that leads him to attempt the reconciliation of Aristotle and Jesus Christ. So here, Rushuni at the end basically says, the basic question is, who is man's savior, Christ or the state? So from there, I want to talk about the messianic character of education in America. So first and foremost, if you're a homeschooler, if you are working in any form of education whatsoever, you must first recognize that merely educating your children will not save their souls. It won't. Now, the state would have you believe that what is wrong with the world today is that children are ignorant and that education, through education, they can save the world. The reason people murder is because they're uneducated. The reason people steal is because they're uneducated. The reason people don't love their neighbor is because they're uneducated. The reason pe fathers leave their homes and abandon their, wi their, their wives and children is because they're uneducated. And on and on and on and on it goes. That is demonic. Very simple. The Bible says nowhere in its context at all that merely educating a human being will regenerate their soul. It won't happen. As Christians, we know that many people, many missionaries taught people, uh, or educated people, specifically in reading and writing, so that they could read the Word of God, not so that they would be saved, 
so that they would become a better man because that is actually what the Greek idea of education did or in their minds does for children is that it makes them into a new man. It takes them from you know the uneducated, ignorant realm of uh, the world and, and, and things like that and, and it takes them and puts them in an ivory tower and only in the ivory tower apart from the world, secluded to your own thoughts and to uh, a coercive teacher in a room, will you then begin to uh, become educated? And it, this, is, this, is, uh, this has been the way people have thought about education since Greece, since um, classical uh, thinking has sort of emerged. And this is the full classical idea that uh, children hate learning, that children must be coerced into learning, and we're going to get into some of those concepts, but I want you to walk with me. I want you to understand why the state uh, claims education for themselves. So I'm not going to be talking about why you should be homeschooling, but instead we're going to talk about why the state educates. The state educates because it thinks it can mold you. The state educates the children of our populace because the state first of all, has a very good understanding that if you get the children, you get the future. So first of all, they're light speed ahead of many Christians because many Christians don't live covenantally, which means they don't live with the idea that their children are the future. In fact, most Christians, it's a given, many of them are pretty sure their children are going to become apostate. And then they quote the book of Proverbs that if you raise a child right, he'll come back later on in his life. And so that you know, Christians are more than happy, or not more than happy, they're just okay with the fact that their, their children are becoming apostates. And they're becoming apostates hand over fist in this culture. And it's because Christians have literally, um, they have segregated their concepts of education from their Christianity. Their Christianity does not inform their methods of education, nor why they should even educate their children. In fact, even many Christians have a messianic view of education that their their uh, their children will become doctors and lawyers, and they'll become these big moral moral superior creatures, and that they'll go on to do bigger and better things. Never mind you that education doesn't deal with the fact that if you're a gambler, it doesn't matter if you make three hundred and fifty thousand dollars and you have a college education and you're a lawyer. If you're gambling all your money away, it, your, your education did nothing for you. Or the fact that if you don't understand economics and you go and get an education or a degree in something that's worthless, you're educa- though you may be, quote, educated, you're now in debt. And you now uh, have a worthless piece of paper that has no value. Or you could blow all your money on, on drugs and alcohol or, you know, women and booze. I mean, whatever you could possibly imagine. We know that most people live within their means or live up to their means. So we know that a lot of people, whether they're making $30,000 a year or whether making $500,000 a year, very few of them are morally uh, convicted enough to save their money because saving money is actually a moral issue. Saving money isn't a neutral, oh, I think it's going to play out in the end. Education can't moralize you. Education can't regenerate the heart of evil men. So before we move forward, we have to make the big distinction between the humanist approach to education and the Christian's approach to education. The Christian denies that that salvation is through education. The Christian outright denies it. It's blasphemous. It is an assault upon the gospel. And we completely and wholeheartedly deny that concept. The humanist does not deny that concept. The humanist says that education is the core of of making man a more moral creature, a better person. Education is the vital part of that salvation. So now keep in mind here at Man at the Gate how I told you that the gospel is not merely for soteriological uh, uh, arguments. The gospel is for every area of life, considering now. The reason most people don't bring the gospel into education is because they believe what the humanists believe. And they've divorced their Christianity and their philosophies, uh, their philosophy about who children are and the nature of children. They've allowed the humanists to lie to them and say that children are uh, what they call blank slates. I think it's tabula rasa. 
is the idea that children, they come out of the womb neutral, completely blank. They're neither good nor evil. So as they come out, depending on what is around them, the child begins to react. And that's what Rush Juni says, that the humanists believe that were merely reactions, that human beings are merely a reaction to their environment. And this is where in our culture you'll see that in that people, when someone murders somebody, they'll say, what could have driven this man to do this? It will never be that he is simply an abominable monster. That could never be it. It has to be what father or mother beat him. Who treated him this way to where he became this way? What did he go through in his life to make this decision? It's always, or is it mental illness? That's the other one, mental illness. What is it, what could it, it could be a number of things as long as it is not a moral condemnation of the murderer or the rapist or anything like that. And so you see this idea sort of uh, pervading the culture because everyone has been raised by the state. They all believe that we're all uh, blank slates. So moving on, I want to keep that in mind. The, the, the fundamental distinction between the humanist idea of salvation and the Christian's idea of salvation. So we're going to move on to an article written at fee.org. Once again, I've told my listeners before, we're going to read a lot of stuff from fee and uh, Mises and uh, some, of the, some of our classical... Um, uh, liberal friends who are, and when I say liberal, I'm not talking about the American idea of liberal dem- Democrats. I'm talking about a uh, a you know a more founding father. Uh, the founding fathers were considered more classical liberals, constitutionalists. And so this is an article titled "Children's and Teen Suicides Related to School Calendar." School is clearly bad for children's mental health. Now this was written in June. Uh, on June 3rd uh, in 2018. So it was written in June of this year by a man named Peter Gray. Here's what Peter says. We get very upset by school shootings as well as we should. Every such instance is a national tragedy. We should be ashamed of ourselves for not doing something about gun control as essentially every other developed world nation has. But as serious as this tragedy is, it is dwarfed by another school-related tragedy, suicide going to make a stop there. Obviously, we don't agree with Peter uh, on on his uh, uh, stance of gun control, but let's move forward. Suicide is the third leading cause of death for school-aged children over 10 years old. I'm going to say that again. Suicide is the third leading cause for of death for school-aged children over 10 years old, and the second leading cause behind accidents and ahead of homicides for those over 15. The evidence is now overwhelming that our coercive system of schooling plays a large role in these deaths and in the mental anguish so many young people experience below the threshold of suicide. Four years ago, I posted data from mental health from a mental health facility in Connecticut showing the relationship between pediatric emergency mental health visits and the school year over a three-year period from 2011 to 2013. Those data reveal that the average monthly number of emergency mental health intakes for school-aged children declined from 185 in May, the last month of school, to 102 in June, the month in which school lets out, and then down to 74 and 66 respectively in July and August, the full months of freedom from school. In September, the rate started its climb back up again. Overall, the rate of such visits during the school months was slightly more than twice what it was in July and August. When I wrote that article, I did not know of any other studies assessing mental health breakdowns as a function of the school calendar. Since that time, more research has emerged. Psychiatric psychiatric breakdowns and suicide attempts as a function of the school year. Colin Leuk and his colleagues examined the rate of psychiatric visits for a da- for danger to self or others at a large pediatric emergency mental health department in Los Angeles on a week-by-week basis for the years 2009 to 2012. They found that the rate of such visits in weeks when school was in session was 118%, greater than in weeks when school wasn't in session. 
In other words, the rate of emergency psychiatric visits was more than twice as high during school weeks as it was during non-school weeks. It's interesting to note that the sharp decline in such emergencies occurred not just during summer vacation, but also during school vacation weeks over the rest of the year. The researchers also found a continuous increase in the rate of psychiatric emergencies during school weeks, but not during vacation weeks over the four-year period of the study. The result is consistent with the hypothesis that the increase in suicide, suicidal idea, ideation and attempts over time is the result of the increased stressfulness of school over this time period and not to some factor that is also present during the summer. In another, more recent study, Gregory Plemons and his colleagues in 2018 this year found that the rate of hospitalization of school-aged children for suicidal ideation and attempts increased dramatically by nearly 300% over the seven years of their study from 2008 to 2015. And each year, the rate of such hospitalizations was significantly higher in the school months than in the summer. So I'm going to stop here because I, th I think that gives us a pretty good idea of what we're talking about. Suicide is is um, astronomically high nationwide. It's at an 8.7 right now. That's what the children, and when I say suicide, we're talking about obviously people attempting suicide. 8.7 kid or 8.7 percent of children from middle school to high school ages are attempting suicide. My school district locally is so bad that they have a suicide prevention team that is on call made up of students in the district who are ready to, um, uh, at moment's notice, take a call from a, a kid attempting suicide. We have to stop and ask real quick, what has happened? What has happened? I mean, the, just last week, I also read an article from Fee that says pediatricians are now being recommend are now recommending to parents prescriptions of play. So we now have pediatricians who recognize that children literally aren't playing anymore. They don't have time to play, and so we are living. Our children are literally killing themselves. They're literally committing suicide in a culture of death. So at the youngest age, now keep in mind, we live in a culture that tells you kids are innocent, they're super pure, they would never do anything wrong, and yet they are the ones who are committing suicide at high, high rates. Almost one in ten. Why is that? Uh, well, because we're asking the children to save themselves. We're telling children through our educational system that if they fail at education, they might as well be worthless. Wow, Carrie, I would never say such a... Yeah, yep, yep, that's how we treat them. I remember going through this as well as a kid. I went through a lot of things as a kid in the public school system. I was on Ritalin from, the, from kindergarten to fifth grade, and then when I went into sixth grade, I was moved into Adderall, and I took Adderall until I was 17. I was drugged the entire time. I was, in, I was in school because I would not sit still, as are most kids. Most kids aren't meant to sit still for eight hours a day for five days a week. It is so not conducive to human nature. It's a lie about human nature. First of all, it's a lie that you can save yourself through, through education. It's a lie that man is a blank slate and that all you have to do is educate him and he becomes a moral creature. Uh, these are all lies. This, I mean, because you have to keep in mind that a politician, because public schooling is, is ingrained into politics. It's not, an, it's not a completely different idea apart from politics. It is literally ingrained into our property. I am taxed. My property is taxed to pay for the lie of humanism, which is that everyone has a right to public education. Everyone has a right, a God-ordained right to be educated. That's another just blasphemous lie. It's a lie. It's just a lie. That you, you won't find it in the scriptures. You won't find this idea that people have a right, a fundamental right to be educated. So kids are killing themselves because they have to live in a fairy tale world. 
they have to live according to a lie. And the lie is that they are blank slates, that they have to sit still for eight hours a day for five days a week, and then they have to go home and do another hour and a half to two hours of homework every day. And then they have to take a test, and that test is everything to them. They fail, if, they, if they fail certain tests, they literally will not advance. They will lose their friends. They'll be made fun of. Um, and, and this doesn't even count how how the kids themselves treat education in the system because they hate it. They hate people who succeed. They hate people who are educated. They hate people who thrive. That constantly, I remember myself constantly bullying people who were very smart because because in that tribalistic system, we hated education. We hated it. And so what we're doing is we are sacrificing our children on the altar of higher education only to oppress them, load them, and ourselves through property tax and college tuition with debt. This includes the property tax, obviously. So the roots, the roots of our higher education are literally into the ground that you sleep on, to the ground that you build your home on. The roots of our rotten fruit reside in the very ground, in eminent domain. So we're going to get to eminent domain one day, but there's another one, another concept keeps popping up, eminent domain, which is the concept that the state owns everything, even the children. Do all kids need to go to college? No. Overwhelmingly, no. If you are listening to me and you are a teenager or middle school, do you have to go to college to succeed and be a happy human being? No. Will college make you happy? No. In fact, many of you might go to college and you will have so much debt that you don't even know what to do with, and you can't get a job for the uh, thing you just got done studying for, for four years. Call, call, people, and this is the problem, skill work is, has been thrown out the, out, out the window. Skilled labor is gone. Almost hand over fist. Plumbers will pay you to apprentice. Um, welders will pay you to apprentice. So imagine if colleges paid you to go to higher education. Would you, which one would you take? If you knew that skilled labor was going to cost you $80,000 in debt before you ever made a dime and you could go to college edu- and you could get a college education, someone would pay you, would you, which one would you choose? Oh, I would choose, I would choose college education if they paid me. What's the opposite today? You have to go into debt to go to college or you could be paid by welding companies and electricians to um, learn the trade. You could be paid. Um, please stop telling people they have to go to college. Please stop. Just don't do it anymore because it's a lie. So must children be forced to learn? So we're going to get into this idea that children have to be forced to learn. Do they hate learning or do they learn naturally and we should guide that learning? When we pretend something that is false about our children's nature, which is that they hate learning and will not learn unless coerced into it, then we lie about God's image in them. Our children love learning. Do they need discipline? Yes. Do they need guidance? Of course. Do I have to force my son to learn about tornadoes? Of course not. So why build a system around this false idea that children will always hate learning? Let me ask my listeners a question. Do you hate learning? Most of you will say no. The book of Proverbs says that a fool hates instruction. If you say yes, then you're a fool. The right answer is no. I don't hate learning. What about math? So this is so let's get on to children. What about math? Show children the value of the skill they are learning as it applies in the real world. This is a covenantal approach to learning. You're going to hear me talk about this idea of covenantal approaches to learning. We make a dire mistake when we disconnect education from the actual world around us and make the classroom the only way to learn about the world we live in. When your kid sees a stop sign and tries to read it, do you stop them because they aren't doing it at a desk and for a grade? All right, so that's an interesting question. Do we stop our children from learning outside of the classroom? Most people will laugh at that and be like, no, of course not. Okay, why do we treat children as if they only learn in classrooms? Why do, we treat, why do we treat children as if the only thing that matters is a test score? I was reading a book uh, called The Read Aloud Family, and this mother was talking about the idea 
that there was a little eight-year-old girl who brought up a book at a library. She had a book she loved. She brought it She brought it up, and she was ready to check it out. And her mother said, hey, is that book on the reading list for your school, the approved curriculum? And the, and the girl was like, oh, no, I just want to read it. The mother became irate and told the mother, told the daughter to put the book back and go get a book that is on the curriculum. <clears throat> and so think about that. What is that? What what did the mother just tell the child subconsciously? Now, obviously, the mother asked her to go get a different book. But what was the mother telling the child subconsciously? She was telling her child that their labor is not for their own enjoyment, but instead for the superiors above them. The children understand that their entire life, even desires, are centrally planned for their good. Of course, this makes learning a burden just as working in the, in the workforce for purely the benefit of superior will kill all work ethic. That's why we hate socialism. So we are teaching practical socialism in our way of life. It just isn't subsidized by our neighbor. So what we're doing is we're teaching our children a socialist idea. And this is why your children, even homeschoolers, are growing up to be socialists. Because we're teaching them that they have to be coerced to do anything that's meaningful, including learning. Like that's the most basic thing you do as a human being. You get up and you instantly start becoming educated because you have to figure out, how do I open this door? How do I read that sign? How do I communicate better? How do I learn about this? Why is this doing this? And so on and so forth. And you begin to look into answers and finding out how to answer answer the problem so that you can be educated, so that you can understand creation. Because we're all getting up and under, trying to understand what God has put us in. What is this, ma- this, this, this amazing place? There's so much to learn. You can learn all day. If you wanted to sit down and read a book and, and read book after book after book after book all day, you could. You can swing an axe all day and constantly learn, constantly be getting better, constantly learn all kinds of things about the skill of swinging an axe. So why do we treat children as if they hate learning when the Bible says nowhere that they hate learning? In fact, the Bible is constantly giving uh, giving children uh, instruction on what they should learn and not to ignore their instruction. Because we know that children will learn no matter what. That's why the Bible says, don't go over there with those guys. Don't sit down with these people. Don't walk over here with these people. Because why? They are going to teach you terrible, terrible things that will lead to your death. So let's reject the practical socialism. Let's reject that. Let's reject it all together and say, I need to think up a different concept that is biblical about who my children are and how I teach them. Because right now we're in a really bad way. Even homeschoolers are in a really bad way. Kids think math is boring until you play board games. Build a, build a birdhouse. You're going to need measuring for that. Or bake cookies. You're going to need fractions for that where they have to use their math skills. So keep that in mind. We, I mean, we will teach kids constantly about math or, or other things, but then we, don't, we actually don't teach them how to apply it because there's no way to apply it when you sit in a chair all day. You can't apply the mathematics that you're using unless it's merely a problem, unless you're just going through the rote memorization of how to understand this concept, but not applying it. So children don't understand what they're doing. They don't understand that they're going to need this math when they roll the dice tonight with daddy and mama at the board table. They're going to need this math to add 6 plus 2 plus 1. But what we do is we divorce we divorce education from the real world. We make education itself all by itself, as Rush Duty calls in the void. We put the education in the void, and all that matters is the rote memorization and the test scores. Never mind that someone who's uh, in high school doesn't want to learn algebra because he's, uh, he's going to become a welder. He only wants to know the math that's needed to weld. That's it. He doesn't want to read poetry. He doesn't want to learn about Shakespeare. You can't make people love learning. You can't make them learn the things you want them to learn. Once again, these are socialist concepts. These are coerced concepts. 
This is why people don't don't many people have no work ethic. These children are coming out of school and they have no work ethic. Why? Because they don't have any individuality. They keep looking up to mom and dad, even at the age of 22, coming out of college. Now what? Now what do I do? Man, we're growing with we, all these. And it's funny because all these conservatives will tell you that, oh, these college students, they're just grown up babies. Who, who raised this generation? Who raised the generation that we're in? Who raised it? Who taught these children and coddled them and kept them in a little bubble and kept them in a school for five, for eight hours a day, five days a week, and then made them come home for two hours to do homework? And then they are constantly never allowed out of that bubble until they're 22 years old. And then they literally pop. They literally can't handle the pressure anymore because they have... They have been told that they are their own saviors. They have to save their souls through education. God forbid you don't get a college education these days. God forbid you don't graduate high school these days. You have to show your children how the skills they are learning apply in their life. The biggest problem we have in our approach to education is that we teach it in a void, completely apart from their daily life. In fact, you don't even have to sit at a table to learn math uh, or reading. Are most you can learn all those skills in daily life. Now, I'm not telling you. I want my leaders, readers to understand. I'm not telling you there's never a time when you should sit down with your children and have a very academic approach to things. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying don't do that all day. That's it. That's it. Two hours is enough for a kid. Two hours, no more. Two, maybe three hours. And then let them go and have fun. Let them go play. My children learn more about playing than anything. My children have learned more math through playing board games than than they'll ever learn sitting at a table. My children have learned more more about reading skills from me reading to them and them reading board game instructions or reading the cards that that they have. Uh, while we're playing board games, you have to teach children that the skills they're learning matter, that they matter in the real world. They don't matter because you told them it mattered. They don't matter because, uh, because they need to pass the test score. No, education is a tool of dominion for humans. For God's people, it is a tool. We are not the tools of education. That's what Aristotle would have you believe, and that's what most humanists in the schools will have you believe, that the children are a tool for the end goal of fixing humanity. The children are the tool of education. So some things to maybe start implementing in your home. I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, that... We live in a fantastic time. I mean, you back in the 80s, you know, back in the 80s, you didn't have the internet. When my son, back in the 80s, and my son wanted to learn about a volcano, we'd have to go to the library. We'd have to go get an encyclopedia, Britannica. I'd have to have an entire volume of what we call the bookshelf Google because you had to have some kind of information source to educate either yourself or or other people around you. And if you didn't have those tools, you had to go to a place that did. Well, now you just have to pay your internet bill and you can get on Google and boom, volcanoes. Obviously, you need to use some discernment. You don't just believe whatever you get on Google. But if you do your research like you were taught in school, if you do your research and you make sure you're fact-checking, you can learn whatever you have to learn, Christian. You need to learn how to fix your washer? Get on YouTube. You know, I mean, there's a, um, there is a Khan Academy. You can look it up. K-A-H-N, Khan Academy. Free education worldwide. Guy is literally doing from kindergarten all the way up to, to college level education. And that's free. Now, guess what? You can't, that, that you can't get a piece of paper doing that. I mean, this is where the state, this is where the state puts up the barriers because I can't just go get on Khan Academy and learn what I need to learn and then go apply uh, at Apple or go apply at, you know, uh, whatever job I want because I don't have the state approved accreditation, which is once again, the state saying that it is the final arbiter of who is educated and who isn't. 
gospel issue. That's a claim to be God. So some things I have started to implement, me and my wife, Sarah, has started to implement with our family is we have started to implement some things called like the Read Aloud Family. There's a book called The Read Aloud Family, a fantastic book. There's a podcast. You can listen to that called The Read Aloud Family. And basically what we have been dealing with with our young children is reading comprehension. Our children, we found out, we're having a hard time with reading comprehension. And basically what's what's happening is that young children have a hard time distinguishing between comprehension of reading and reading skills. So a kid can be amazing at reading skills. They can just read like a like a tornado and then you ask them to, to comprehend what they've just read and to maybe tell you or summarize what they've read and they can't. Well, that's because their brain is still developing. Well, never mind you, the school doesn't care about that. The school just say, hey, we need the test done. You can read it. You should be able to comprehend it. Well, that's not the way a child's brain works. So what we've started doing is I've recognized that if I read to my children every single day, whether it's from the Word of God or whether it's from a novel, whatever, be reading to every single child you have every single day, you will notice that their reading comprehension will skyrocket and it will change their life. I'm telling you, start reading a book to your children every day. Make books available to your children. Don't treat your children like you have to force them to read. Show your children that reading is a blessing and it's fun. Surround your house with books. Make your house a library. I'm not joking. Make it a library. I've got books, me and my wife, we have books laying all over the place. And they're not even ours. They're almost of them are our kids. There is not a surface you will find in my home almost that doesn't have a book on it. Even the floor's got books on it. Why? Because we understand that children don't hate learning. And our children are a testimony to that truth. Because our children don't hate learning. It's fun to learn in this home. Why? Because there's not tests there's not pressure to perform. There's not a, a high expectation to save yourself through high education. There's none of that pressure applied to my children. So the, the book of Proverbs presupposes that children do not hate learning. It warns against the sin of slothfulness in learning, as well as rejecting what your parents teach you. That's what we talked about. So the question is, what will we teach them? Not necessarily how. What are you going to teach your children? So I want to go to the scriptures here. All right, so let's read this here. We, we're, I'm at Proverbs 22, verse 15. Let's see what it says here. It says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far away from him. Proverbs 29, 15 says, The rod of reproof give wisdom. Are the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Proverbs 29, 17 says, Discipline your son, and he will give you rest. He will give delight to your heart. So what do our children need? They need discipline. Well, Carrie, that's what we're doing in the schools. We're teaching these kids discipline. We're teaching them how to sit still. We're teaching them how to dress like everyone else. We're teaching them how to be submissive. What do you want? Kids just run around do whatever they want? No. Children need to be disciplined. That's, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Children do not need to be subjugated. There's a difference between a child being disciplined and a child being subjugated. Children are subjects. They are subjugated. They are oppressed in, in, in the public school system. It is the most unnatural environment you can put a child in. It's the most unnatural environment. We don't even, we aren't even in that environment half the time. How many of us sit down for eight hours a day? Many of us do. Some of us maybe sit at a desk. We have a desk job. Good for you. Not everyone should be sitting at a desk. Not everyone wants to sit at a desk. And to make people sit at desks all day, even if they don't want to, uh, can literally, is literally driving kids to kill themselves because they don't want to be at school anymore. Because a 13-year-old already knows he wants to be an electrician or a welder. He's like, why do I have to be here now? Why can't I start working at the age of 14? Oh, Carrie, you're talking about child labor. I sure am. Because guess what? I'm not talking about kids working in salt mines. I'm talking about once a, once a child becomes mature enough to know what they want to do and they're competent and they have the skills to accomplish it, accomplish it, what are you doing other than protecting the jobs of older people? 
Could you imagine how successful a child would be if they started as a welder at the age of 15 or 16 as an apprentice learning slowly but surely and by the age of 21, they would they would be profoundly proficient welders. They wouldn't just be coming into the profession, they would be teaching the profession. But we prolong childhood in our in our nation as long as we possibly can we prolong it. <clears throat> And I'll tell you honestly that putting children in chairs for eight hours a day not only is presupposing a heretical view about their nature, but it it is also provoking them to anger. It's provoking them to anger and anxiety. We 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 have literally built a systematic approach and institution to constantly causing anxiety and tempting our children into anger. This, the system is built that way. Why? Because people are, too, are literally too lazy to educate their kids. I'm not lazy, Carrie. I work every day. Yeah, you do. A lot of people have decided that they would rather work, they would rather make money than educate their kids. And guess what? It's a pretty basic thing. If you don't want to educate your children, don't have any. And that is extremely sinful. To not have children merely because you don't care enough to educate them. Unless someone's going to do it for you, I don't want to do it. You know, Carrie, educating is not for everybody. That's not what God's Word says. God's Word doesn't say, uh, some of you in Deuteronomy chapter 6, some of you can walk with your children. Some of you can lie down, sit up, talk, and teach them whenever you want. Some of y'all don't have to do that, though. You just figure it out for yourself. What I mean, whatever you just lean on your own understanding. I am extremely disheartened about the way we treat our children in this culture and how how we prolong we prolong the teenage years as long as we possibly can. And that's why you have man babies. That's why you, most of the culture today is just full of adolescent men who are 45 years old and they still get drunk every Saturday and they hate their jobs and they only live for the weekends. They they're no different. Most of them are no different than they were at the age of 16 ready to get out of school, ready to start the weekend, and finally have some freedom. Even if that freedom is to just be as debaucherous as you possibly can because they have no control over their lives. They have nothing, no, no control whatsoever. They have, to, they have to do rote memorization, which is shown to do nothing. It doesn't, it doesn't educate anybody. Do, just saying the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, it doesn't do anything unless you can apply it in your life. Can I apply it in my life? Then it's meaningless. The second you realize that uh, there's something you're learning that can, literally will never be used in your life, you won't remember it because it has no value to you. It's not a tool to you. But yet you got to remember it long enough so that you don't fail and so that the world doesn't reject you. Not to mention that most kids aren't going to sit down all day, so they have to be pilled. They have to, they have to be given pharmaceutical drugs because they can't sit still. I mean, you, you're literal, we're literally molding children to a false reality. We only test them so that we can get more funding for our schools because we're told that schools need more money. Not, never mind you that administrative costs are skyrocketing in the last decade, that there are more people who want to be a supervisor and, a, and an administrator making $150,000, $200,000 a year then most people want to be a teacher. See, mo- mo- no one wants to be a servant. No one wants to serve. Everyone wants to be in a position of authority making a ton of money. But if you took the money and you gave most of it to the teachers, no one would be an administrator. This is why administration is growing and teachers are, are, are going away. Because no one wants to serve anymore. And, and we know that. We know that because no one stays at home with their kids. No one wants to even serve them. We, I mean, we just started school this week or last week, and I mean, you just get bombarded with people thankful that their children are leaving. They're just happy as can be that that they don't have to put up with their kids all day. And what what does that tell your children? What does it tell your kids? See, these people aren't. They can't even think past tomorrow. They they're not going to think in a decade their kids are going to look at their Facebook and be like, "Man, mom and dad really hated us." They really hated us. They really hated being around us. 
No, I don't even want to have kids. That must have been miserable. You have to excuse me. You hear my kids in the background, perhaps. They're playing in the backyard. So it's time that we, we, we take education and we apply it back into the real world. We do as the Bible says, which is getting up and moving around. Let's go look at the trees outside and, and, and learn about them instead of sitting at a, at a desk and learning about trees apart from the environment. This would, be like, this would be like trying to teach someone how to be a welder and they're never allowed to go into the workshop. You can't go into the welding workshop. You have to learn everything you need for in there here in a test. We're going to test you in here on how to, how, how, you know, if you're, if you're going to be a carpenter, how to swing a hammer. If you're going to be a farmer, we're going to ask you a question on how to sow a seed. We're not going to go show you because most kids would learn instantly if you just went out and showed them and you let them make mistakes and you taught them mistakes are are what you need to make in order to become better most kids can't stand mistakes now because they know what mistakes mean a failure a test has gone bad they're 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 not getting it right because they don't understand that education is their tool they they've bought into the lie from humanists that they are the tool of education. They are the ones to be molded. This doesn't even account for peer pressure. This doesn't even account for the sex, the drugs, and the, uh, the, the late night partying and the debauchery that takes place. And the drinking, the binge drinking. I was a binge alcoholic by probably the age of 16. Why do kids lash out like this? Why are they going crazy on the weekends? Because they have no they have no say over their lives. They have no control. Everyone controls everything that they do. And they would rather and, and they're man fears, just like we are. Our children are not innocent. They are sinners, debaucherous sinners. They need Jesus Christ, not an education. They don't need socialization. Our children don't need socialization with other kids who believe a false narrative about reality. Our children need to be socialized by their, by their parents, by more mature people. And that's the evolutionary lie that everything has to be segregated by ages. That's why, that's why by the age of 18, you're still a child because you've always been around children. And the only adult is the one who lies to you about your nature and about the and, and about the, the the goal of education. There's no time for family. When you come home, you have you're, you're home at five at four or five o'clock. You have two hours of, of of homework to do. And if you aren't completely brain dead by then, a kid just wants to sit down and relax and watch some TV. They don't have time for mom and dad. They don't. They can't even remember what they learned today. They can't even remember uh, uh, that some girl tried to kiss them, or they can't remember that uh, some that uh, you know uh, there was a talk about gay marriage, and they were kind of and their kids were kind of starting to to think it's okay. They can't remember their day. It's been ten hours of nonstop going every single day. And you want their and you want your kid to just regurgitate everything at a whim like they're a computer. It's not going to happen. There's no time for family. Family is constantly segregated. They're segregated during the day, and when they come home, they only come home to be housed. And then they're constantly at odds, and they're dysfunctional. The family is dysfunctional because the children understand that the parents are idiots because the parents have told them that the professionals educate them. That means that the parents are not good at educating. They don't know much. The, we're the dum dums, and that's and that's what American culture has always said. Media has always portrayed parents, specifically men, fathers, as abysmal idiots. And your children believe it when you send them to professionals. They believe you. They believe. I believe you, mom and dad. Y'all are dumb. I'm gonna go learn from the people who know something because you people don't know nothing. Other than that, you complain about socialism and yet you send us to a socialist school. Oh, okay, yeah. Why are my children abandoning the Lord? I can't imagine. Now, now throw in the bullying, the hyper-tribalism, the demand to cut your hair the same way, the demand to fit in, 
you will never run into this kind of uh you have the goths you got the jocks you got the you got the uh you know the the geeks you got the freaks you got every single niche you can possibly imagine you will only find that in prisons you'll only find that in prisons in gang life and the high school because once you get out of high school you might find a little bit in college obviously college you either in college you're either like i'm never going to do that again or you're like i'm going to become a nazi feminist and i'm going to like take this to the next level you won't run into this hyper tribalism only in places where people are confined and not allowed to leave then they create their own social system that is completely different from the rest of the world because they have to. It's Lord of the Flies in the middle schools and high schools. They have a completely different system in there on how they talk to each other and how they socialize. I don't even know what it's like now with social media. I, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine being bullied in, in this age. I, I, no wonder kids are killing themselves. It's statist indoctrination every day. Every day standing up, putting the hand over the heart, and then pledging allegiance to both the United States and if you're in Texas, pledging it to Texas. We had a kid in our in – our, I remember in my class in middle school, he wouldn't stand up. He was sent to the principal's office. He was made to stand up, but he never said it. He never, he never recited it. You are demanded to conform, and it's the state who's the one who's educated you. And most kids will be like, thank God the state was there because if they weren't, my parents wouldn't have even educated me because I was nothing but a burden to them. You know, Jesus said that the student only the student eventually becomes the teacher. You know, keep that in mind. Well, Carrie, you know, we got to bring the Bible back into the schools. We got to teach creationism. No, you need to teach children that you should pay for your own education and that other people shouldn't shouldn't be stolen from to pay for your education. I mean, that's ultimately you got to start there. That's covenantal approach. My children know that they're here at home so that other people don't pay for their education. My children will tell you, oh yeah, my dad pays for my education. Most people don't. I don't hide these concepts from them. We're talking about politics. We're talking about economics. We're talking about covenant. We're talking about God. Uh, Jed Shirley brought this one up to me many, many uh, months ago, maybe even years ago. Luke chapter 1 verse 17 and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the, the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and make ready for the Lord a people prepared. The gospel is supposed to turn fathers' hearts back to their children. How sick and perverted have we become that most Christian fathers have rejected their children and their hearts are not turned towards their children they are hardened towards their children and they send them to a complete stranger who believes a false lie about creation and is now going to indoctrinate your children about the complete opposite of christian thought and worldview if this is one of you and you have complained about the nature of our of our society please now is your cue to remain silent you are guilty it is your fault. If you're a conservative and you're more angry that the Bible isn't taught in schools as opposed to the fact that schools are funded by property theft, shame on you. Repent. Jesus is Lord. Turn your heart back to your children. So you need to allow your children to have some, you need to allow, so what do we do, Carrie? First of all, you need to have, allow your children to have some say about their day. You need to allow their, your children, when you're in the middle of a lesson and you're teaching something and your child says, how do ants build ant mounds? You make it your priority for the day when you're done doing whatever it is that you're doing at the time. To now help your child pursue the things your child wants to pursue. You see, nothing's magical about God's creation when every single question a child asks is responded by a huff and a puff and uh, uh, you know, a clear sign that you're annoyed with them. 
There's nothing magical about the world now. So you have to ask yourself, how important are your children? Please don't take the home the, please don't take the public schooling idea of 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 a 9 to 5 school day and implement, implement it in your home. What's the point? Why take a failing system that you brought your children out of and duplicated at home? Allow your children to say, "Why is that person dressing that way?" And don't say, "Oh, we'll talk about that when you get older." That's another thing we have to stop doing is putting off the ad, the put making our children ch, uh, stay perpetual adolescents for their whole life. You're not going to talk to them about sex until they're 14 or you're not going to talk to them about gay marriage until they're 16 or you know, cuz by the way they're going to learn all this. They they're not idiots. You know, I wrote down here that we all really enjoy movies like um what is it? Uh, we all enjoy movies like Sandlot or Stranger Things or The Goonies or Stand By Me. And that's because those old school movies and Stranger Things is a newer movie, but it is made in the vein of those old school ideas. Those old school movies, they really portray children in a real way. They don't lie about kids. They don't make them this this uh this uh blank slate that is pure and it, it you know it does whatever it you know it's oh it's so um untouched stranger things and stand by me and goonies and sandlot they're full of abominable sinners they're full of sinners who need jesus christ who cuss who smoke who are competent your children are competent christian they're not idiots in fact, it's funny whenever I watch, you know, one character comes to mind from Rugrats, an old cartoon about babies. And I think her name was Angelica. And what she, she and, and it's funny because the, the creators of Rugrats understood the nature of children really well. Because they made Angelica to where she was a mean little witch whenever she was around the babies. She was mean, very competent in her deceptive behavior and she was just as manipulative as you could get and then when her mom and dad would come around her mom and dad had an idea a false idea a humanistic idea about her that she's just this sweet little child oh she's so wonderful look at angelica isn't she so pretty and then angelica would bat her eyes oh i know mommy and daddy i love you so much and then they would leave and she would turn in a heartbeat and the person she was when her parents weren't around is really who she was. And this is why Stand By Me, Goonies, Stranger Things, and Sandlot are amazing. Because it depicts children away from their parents who think they're incompetent. And it's full of stories about competent, sinning kids. And those are kids we know because those are who we were. We, see, we aren't like we picture our kids to be now. See, now that we're adults, we want to think that our kids are pure and way better than we were, but we remember what we were like as kids. We weren't this idea that we've portrayed or that we've projected onto our kids that they're innocent. I smoked a cigarette, I think, for the first time at the age of 10 or 11. You know, uh, you know, other things were going on when I was very, very young that I had no business doing. And, and in no way am I condoning the behavior you see in a lot of those films. But what I am saying is that those are contrasting differences between what we think children are like, what we want children to be, and what they actually are. Fully competent human beings for the most part. I'm not saying kids are, you know, are 25-year-old men. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is children understand politics. Children understand economics. Children understand God. Children understand advanced concepts like abortion and even even regulation. I was playing a game uh, yesterday called Papers, Please, and I was basically showing my son how immigration works in a tyrannical government through this game. 
and it took my son probably 20 or 30 minutes, but he loves video games just like I do. And this was a very heavy concept. And he kept telling me, I don't understand. I don't understand. And I just kept answering his questions. And instead of forcing him and like sitting him down, you've got to understand. I just let him watch and he, he would ask questions and it took him time, but he got it. I didn't, I didn't hide it from him. I didn't say, oh, this is too much for him. He probably wouldn't understand this. Children know when you're sheltering them. You know, you homeschoolers are trying to shelter them. Actually, no, I'm trying to do the complete opposite. The, 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 the public school system is sheltering them from reality. That's what that is. That is a full shelter where they create their own where they create their own worldview, where they create their own social interactions, where they create their own uh, system of thought and their own social orders. You go in there and those kids have created intense social orders that are completely different from anything you'll ever see in the world. Why? Because they're segregated from the rest of the world and they're forced to stay there. So they create these elaborate social networks. They create these elaborate social groups. And Lord of the Flies is another excellent book that captures that. It doesn't It doesn't lie to you about, oh, these children are so perfect and angelic. No, they become de- more and more and more demented. So, Christian, I really want to challenge you to take your children to work more often. To stop saying, I'll tell you when you get older. To start living a covenantal life for your children to be walking with you, growing with you, learning with you. For them to know that education isn't divorced from the rest of the world, but that it is intricately a part of the family and a part of life. You have to, tr- you have to teach your children to teach their children this. You can't just presuppose that their kids know this stuff. You have to tell them there is a system of thought out there that is going to try to trick you into thinking that the state is what is going to mold the children through education and that through all of that, they will be saved. That education will save them and make them moral creatures. Don't, Christian, please don't make education the savior in your home. Jesus Christ is the savior in the home. And if you've made an idol out of education, you must repent. Turn to Christ. He is the king. He is the one who gives wisdom. Fear the Lord. That's that's where wisdom comes from. The fear of the Lord is where the wisdom begins. I hope I hope I've I hope I've not rambled too much. I mean, we we I haven't even I haven't even touched the iceberg here. I could I could do episodes upon episodes, and maybe I will. Maybe I will uh, do uh, more episodes on homeschooling. Maybe I need to. But for now, let it suffice to say that even the way we're doing homeschooling in many ways is um, is no different than what than the same worldview that is in the schools. It's no different. We have we still completely structure our children's day, all day at home. Uh, we do not allow them any type of indi- individuality. Uh, we actually see individuality uh, uh, as bad, even from a Christian perspective. We try to Christianize it and and say that being an individual is bad, and that th- thinking your own individual thoughts is wrong. Instead of teaching our children to fear the Lord and to showing them through our actions and through our faith that the Lord is sovereign, not the state. We have very, very, very in-depth conversations about uh, about politics in my home with seven, with a seven and nine-year-old. Uh, if you're a homeschooler, t- TuttleTwins.com. Uh, Go there, look up Tuttle Twins. That's a great, great resource for teaching your children about economics and politics. Yeah, you're gonna have to you have to use some discernment, and you're gonna have to put in the gospel where you think it needs to be, and you're gonna have to uh, maybe write some write uh, steer the steer the boat a little bit when you read those books. But uh, they are some of the most amazing resources I've ever used. Tuttle Twins. You have to protect your children at the home from nationalism. Nationalism is pervasive in the state. The state has to 
teach children to be nationalistic. It has to mold them to be nationalistic. In fact, they know they have to. They have the idea in their mind that the children are just to be molded. So we have to teach them statism. We have to teach them to worship the state. You have to do the complete opposite. Don't teach them to worship the family at home. Please don't do that. Please. You have tons of homeschoolers who worship their families. They have, they have taken statism and they've put it into the mold of, of the family. And now they have a very statist approach to their, to, their, to their families. They worship their families instead of the Lord. You must worship the Lord. You must tell your children the Lord is king in this home. Even over our education. Even over the methods of our education. Un, and, and if you've treated your children this way, uh, up, repent to them. Start doing your researching. There's some good stuff written by unschoolers. I know that's a big no-no for most Christians. Unschooling. Look it up. Do some reading. Once again, you're going to have to use some discernment, Christian. But guess what? There are no other Christians writing about this. There are hardly any other Christians doing any heavy lifting on this topic. I wish I could write everything I needed to write, but I would tell you to start with Rush Dooney. Start with Rush Dooney, start reading his position papers, get his book about the messianic character of, of American education. You have to learn. You can't just sit around and, hey, you know, uh, you know, watch Netflix all day. You've got to pick up a book, Christian. You can't educate your children if you're not educated. You can't have an educated idea about education if you're not educated. And this is a moral issue. How we educate our children is a moral issue. It's not a no neutral issue. This is an issue that we must bring under the dominion of Christ and we must arrive to a biblical idea of how and what we do about education with our children. It's not enough to homeschool. That's not going to save your children. Not even, not even homeschooling your children perfect will save your children. Only the Lord Jesus will do that. Thank you, Lord, because we all know we wouldn't save our children, not through education. And that's why we also have to confront the public school system. We also have to demand that property tax be abolished so that we are no longer a part of that, uh, that idol. It's got to be destroyed. Let other people pay for their education. This does not mean that Christians shouldn't start schools. Please start schools. Start watching other people's children who can't. Offer to do so. Offer to teach the children. The churches need to start building, public, building schools. Charities need to start building schools. Not so that you can make money, but so that we can rescue those who are being led to the slaughter. Your children are being led to the slaughter at the public school system. They are literally killing themselves. They are, be they are, growing they are making a culture of death. And it's time that we take the battle to them. It's not time to survive, Christian. I'm not asking you to survive in this culture. I'm telling you to go forward. You have to, we have to start writing our congressmen. We have to start writing our representatives locally at the Texas level to abolish the property taxes in our, in, our, in our state, to force people to educate their own children. Humanitarianism is demonic. The fact that education must be, must be given to all children is a demonic idea in the sense that it has to be used at the end of a gun. Everyone's okay with coercion. Everyone's okay in this country with coercion because we were, we were indoctrinated with coercion. That's what I've been telling you this whole episode. The children are constantly coerced into learning. They're constantly forced to learn. So they are completely okay with forcing others to do other things because that is all they've ever known. Their whole life has been structured about, around coercion and being forced to learn. They have been taught that might is right. And now you, if you have put your children in that system, you now have to deal with the fruit of that system. And this is the fruit of that system. All right, guys, I do not have time for a side um, story. I think this is good enough. 
Um, I would have liked to cover more, but as I said, that's where we're, that's where we're at. So God bless you guys. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May you grow. I hope if you have much to say about education, please do write a book. If you agree with me and you're like, hey, this needs to be said. I need to get 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 down to doing work. Please do it. I'm doing this podcast because work's got to be done. God bless y'all. If you're a homeschooling mama, you really are just, you are the bee's knees. Especially you, my wife. God bless. Thank you for listening to Man at the Gate. Go forward, Christian, and apply your ethics to all areas of life. Begin to discern the world around you. God bless. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His Kingdom.